Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I'm your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with an American tennis legend, a global tennis legend, um, one of my favorite people on the tour, one of my favorite people to drink with, one of my favorite people to actually coach against because she can talk trash and not take it personal and give it back to you, Coco Vandeweghe. Here, here I am. Here Welcome I am. To the, <laughs> well, to, so, so the tennis world misses you. And let me tell you how I know the tennis world misses you. Right now, every time someone loses, they hug like their best friends. Yeah, I I don't I don't get it. I I did not grow up in that era of anyone liking each other ever. <laughs> I mean, there was a select few that maybe you had like not I wouldn't say like, but at least respect for. Um, but yeah, the locker room environment was a lot different with the, the Sharapovas, the Kuznetsovas, the Yankoviches, the Ivanovich. I mean, you, you name it, we had the drama in the locker room. So it's very different to see the, yeah, everyone had a good tournament and everyone had a good match. Let's hug it out. It's just, it's weird to me. <laughs> I know it's kind of like, no, I want to win. You know what I mean? It was kind of like really weird to be, it's hard to be happy for me as a competitor. It's hard to be happy for the opponent that won and went on to make probably a hundred grand more because they won another round, right? And it was like, and, and got more ranking points in a, in a sport where like, the worse you do, the actually better I do. Like if you lose points and you don't defend points, I actually can move up being at home. So I'm kind of incentivized to root against you. But in this time, it's like, we hug it out. We're happy for the opponent. We're wishing them good luck. I'm kind of like, no, fuck you. Like I'm mad I lost. You know what I mean? I mean, I could see it like maybe like an hour or two later, like after you've calmed down and maybe like, you know, had had the post-match meal or something, but like straight afterwards, I, I remember it so distinctly. I ha there's like this zoom in on my face after I lost the Venus in the semis of Australia. I'm like stone cold piss, right. like stone cold piss. And it's like, I have the utmost respect for V and, and like, you know, it was a three set match. So like nothing, like I didn't get spanked or anything, but like, I was like, pissed off like I lost I lost the opportunity to play for a grand slam like why would I be happy about this <laughs> what do I like congrats V but like I don't give a crap like at all about you right now I'm freaking pissed right so so I don't know what anybody else listening but I miss that I miss like the cheer <laughs> especially from women because you know like girls are like we sort of raise girls to like play nice play each other's hair share that kind of thing and I'm kind of like no nah, I kind of screw that like try to kill her you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Go at it. Like, cause boys, we teach them, we give them one ball and we teach them to fight over it. But the girls, we got to play nice. So I get a little bit of like old school sexism when I see like the people playing nice. You know what I mean? So I just, I, I remember, I remember this on the Coco days where she's cracking a racket and giving like the <laughs> ice cold handshake. I mean, ice cold handshake. <laughs> I never gave dead fishes, but I certainly would squeeze a little bit harder at on certain people than like others. But the dead fish was like never a, a go for me. I couldn't do that. But my mom raised me just differently. I mean, she, I was part of the the group of girls that uh, I have a younger sister. So like the two of us, if we were crying and there was no blood, there'd be she'd give us something to cry about. So that's kind of why like I, I'm a rough and tumble kind of person, not not like soft and be nice like. I, I hated dolls anyway. <laughs> so you've got the famous last name. Every other day someone asks me, oh, is Coco Vandaway Kiki Vandaway's daughter? I'm like, no, niece-ish. Coco, you know, Kiki had a sister, right? That kind of thing. Tell me about sort of your journey in tennis. Because when I think about your, your relatives, I think about basketball, I think about swimming. And looking at your, your height and your build, you could have been either one. How did you fall into this sport? Well, I actually loved basketball. I um, was, uh, I made an all American actually. Um, so I was pretty good, but I was just, I realized I played in the um, all American game and it definitely was a different group of girls coming in from, you know, closer to, to downtown San Diego and some of the LA chicks. And I'm like, Whoa, I'm not, I'm not like this kind of level. Like it was, these girls play 
AAU, they play, you know, for their school. Me, I just like play pickup and with my older brother and like join my school team. And then otherwise I was playing tennis. So it was like a secondary sport to me, but I loved playing. My mom uh, tried to get me to stop playing basketball a lot earlier. And um, I would sneak with my grandfather because my grandparents lived with me. So I was raised by my two grandparents and my mom. And my grandfather would sneak me out to go make the basketball game against my mom's wishes. So I was definitely a, a rebel going to play basketball. And then I had one bad season that like girls just didn't pass me the ball because I was missing practices for tennis and tennis practices for basketball. But, you know, catty, catty chicks and they just stopped <laughs> passing me the ball. And I was like, well, screw this. I don't need this. I can go play tennis. Like, why would I care about playing basketball and have to deal with teammates and and all those other like catty nonsense issues that go along with it. And then how'd you evade swimming? Cause your mother was a great swimmer. Yeah, and- she was a she was an Olympian in, in swimming uh, in 76 with the East German chicks. Um, and she gave me every opportunity to try any sport I wanted along with trying music plays and, and wherever I fell into. Cause my grandmother's also Miss America and was on Broadway. So like, I have a prethla of like things I, I have avenues into as far as like what my family has done and who's kind of involved in what. And my mom just said I was a terrible swimmer, like uh, just bad. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she was not, she was not unhappy that I, I did not pick up swimming, but she fell in love with tennis after her own sporting career. She went to New York and went into broadcasting and she broadcasted in the NBA as a sideline reporter in the after, um, after you know, game kind of wrap up. And, and she fell into tennis just being in New York and, and playing and, and picking up a different sport to keep in shape. And so she always dreamed of me going into tennis. And how she did that was made my older brother go play because I just wanted to do everything he did. So that's how I ended up in tennis. Ah, so you take Olympic sw- Olympian genes, like right, swimming genes. You take basketball jeans and you put them on a tennis court with a guy named Guy Fritz, <laughs> who is, for those who don't know, the father of Taylor Fritz, right? So he basically, you were like his guinea pig, so he could make like a top 10 ATP player. Yeah, in, in a way. I mean, like he, I've known Taylor since he was eight years old. So my older brother and I babysat him, like, you know, got him all the pizza and everything like that when we were teenagers and probably too young to be babysitting, but whatever. Two of us were, were better than one. And I grew up going, you know, down the road to Guy's house and, and practicing serves or watching Amber Lou, Michael Chang's wife hit, cause she's from San Diego too. He would call me up and be like, Amber's hitting, come watch. Um, and he, was, he actually was really good for me because he spoke my mom's language, which was being an old school Olympian where they would rip you out of a pool and hit you with a kickboard if you weren't swimming fast enough and <laughs> misbehaving. And not that guy hit me with a kickboard or anything, but like I got tossed off the court more times than not. Um, but he, I mean, he taught me discipline. He sent me to Jose Higueras' spot in Palm Desert, which I hated. I was not an academy kid. I <laughs> loved being home. I loved going to school. And um, But he was just like, you know, kids are actually taking this seriously you're off playing basketball or you know hanging out at school all day these kids are doing this all day tennis 24 7 I was like I don't care I'm pretty good so I can I can do it the way I'm doing it like you know an hour a day and just kind (laughs) of screwing around and then I found out it wasn't quite enough so um you had to see it to believe it but guy kind of could speak my mom's language which helped me in order to speak my language Mm. but I will say Playing other sports as a as a female does help you develop athletic skills that tennis doesn't teach you, right? Like oh, absolutely. Above the head dexterity. I mean, like the the worst thing on the planet is to teach a girl how to serve, right? So it's kind of <laughs> like literally they've got no. I mean, I always this is just a true story. The girls come to the sport having never used their non dominant hand, where boys are using their non dominant hand to play baseball to play basketball, to do all types of things. And we're trying to get a girl to toss a ball with her non-dominant hand to a perfect spot every time. And they're like, well, I can barely write in cursive with my dominant hand. Now you want well, me to- I'm, I'm ambidextrous, so I can, I can do any sort of 
tricks and trades. I, I always say that all my drinking games, I play left-handed. So like <laughs> intricate, like movements. Um, I bowl left-handed. I used to write in school left-handed, but they switched me to write. And I do all my swings lefty and I can throw a spiral with both hands. So I've, I've just grown up in an environment with, uh, especially my grandfather. Um, he played in the NBA also in the fifties while going to medical school um, mm. in Columbia. So, you know, big, big wig out there before Kiki even made it to the Knicks, but he was, it was always important that like, you know, he'd be throwing, throwing a ball at me while I wasn't looking to see if like my reactions and, and peripheral and all that stuff before I even knew what I was doing it just as a kid, you thought it was just fun, you know, react and, and do some cool stuff or like, you know, taught me how to hit dirty in a basketball game when the ref wasn't looking. I mean, I just thought it was all cool. So. <laughs> and then you took that to the tennis court. Yeah, I just haven't figured out how to do it to to an opponent. Maybe I mean, doubles. I'll just tag somebody. That's the oh, easiest way. That that is for sure. So yeah. so that dexterity is where that two hand backhand comes from because I do say the backhand, your backhand is one of the best I've ever seen, and it comes from being able to use your left hand on the left side, like just super crazy. It was actually really difficult because I was so left hand dominant that I couldn't figure out what to do with my right hand over here uh, mm -hmm. on the backhand side, and actually took a lefty um, tennis pro, which was Guy's brother, Harry, uh, to be like, are you left-handed? I was like, yeah, actually, I do a lot of things lefty. And he's like, well, why don't you just hit a lefty forehand with, and the right hand goes long for the ride. And I was like, cool, because I almost had a one -y. I I just I was giving up on the two-hander. I almost had a one <laughs> So when did you realize you were good, right? Because you're playing multiple sports, probably decent at all of them. Like, I remember when I went to um, – high school I went to a school named Whitney called Whitney Young and on that team we had like Dennis Gates who's the coach of Missouri we had Quentin Richardson who had 16 years in the NBA Cordell Henry which was the point guard for Marquette when Dwayne Wade was there I think they went to the final four or elite eight or whatever it is so basically with basketball tryouts told me that I should go play tennis so when did you sort of have that like aha moment where it was like okay I should just like drop it and play tennis yeah, I, I, it was a little bit of bad um, teammates and also playing in my first All-American game where I got to see other very good uh, women uh, basketball players. And um, it was actually my grandfather who sat me down and he said, you know, I was 13 and or just 14, actually. Sorry. And I said and he's like, you know, um, it's time to kind of pick a sport you want to take seriously. Like, I think you should sit quietly in a room and um you know I not to not to preach God onto anyone but you know if, if you sit quietly enough you'll get an external voice that will tell you and kind of lead you into an avenue which might be advantageous and so I sat there quietly bored probably was like five minutes I don't know and just I just felt like tennis was it and I was not a good junior tennis player I really didn't do well in tennis um until I was probably like 14, 15, um, because I mean, one, I was playing a, a completely different sport at a high level, but it was also the way Guy Fritz taught was, it wasn't so much about the now game of like winning 14 nationals or even 16 nationals. Like I didn't play clay courts ever in, in national events. I only played hard courts and I, I played 16s once and then played 18s two times as a uh, 15 year old and as a 16 year old and uh, he was just more about end game if you're going to be a professional player like we're working on so many different things the, the serve the serve volley the learn how to hit a slice backhand I mean things that develop and like he'd make me do it in matches in junior matches and I'd be struggling thank god there was no UTR when I was playing juniors because okay. I, I lost killer. so many matches that, done. That I wouldn't have made it that number is a career killer. It makes you focus so much on the now. I don't, I don't it makes you duck it. matches. Like, it, listen, I was a consolation champ. I did not <laughs> lose in consolation. <laughs> I, I won for fear of death that if I lost twice in a tournament, good God, I was done. Right. And then also it's just like pride factor. I wasn't going to let these chicks beat me twice. And, and <laughs> so that's, I mean, that's kind of it was just, and somehow it just clicked all at, all at once when um, I got, I actually got called up Richard Ashby, awesome man. 
uh, was my year coach at USTA. And unfortunately, but fortunately for me, I was not the top three best Americans for my age group. And it was uh, Junior Fed Cup in Italy. And it was Asia Muhammad, Lauren Embry, who had a great career at Florida, and Allie Will, who also played at Florida. Mm -hmm. And Allie Will hurt her ankle at Easter Bowl. And I got called up for Allie and it just like clicked. I got to see international tennis. I traveled internationally for the first time and got to play on clay for the first time. And it was just so eye-opening and amazing. And I was just like, cool, this is what I want to do. And I, I did well at 18 nationals, won the constellation there and then just kept progressing and getting better and better. And somehow I won junior U S open for the first time at, at 16. So you think about you. So when I think about Coco Vandeweghe, I say today, she is the best American woman that I've ever seen play, not to win a slam. I but got a double knows. slam. Double slam, not to win a single slam. <laughs> and, and that counts, trust me. We're going to get to that too. Um, <laughs> but I think of some of your magical slam runs though. 2017 US Open and then Wimbledon. Tell me about the 2017 U.S. Open, because that was a crazy open. I threw four Americans in the semis. Uh, New York traffic, freaking crazy. Pat Cash was the code. Tell me about your 2017 <laughs> U.S. Open slam. Yeah, I, I was going into 2017 U.S. Open. I had final Stanford, lo losing to Madison Keys, um, won doubles. I was just winning everything, or at least finaling most everything, leading into Stanford. And I already semied Australian Open, losing to Venus. And then I went on to go into the US Open with so much confidence of just like, this is my moment. This is my time. Like, you know, I, I'll, I'll get this done. And I almost lost first round to Ali Risk. So it was not, I barely squeaked that out in three sets. It always but happens each, that way. It, it's, it was. I was so pissed and Pat was like pissed at me about my attitude out there on the court. And Allie always gave me fish. She makes a lot of balls and like just is tenacious enough to just drive you up a wall. And I keep going, I keep going and I get to the semis and I, and I'm playing Madison and keys and I'd lost to her twice already at the U S open series, once at Stanford and once at Cincinnati. I'm like, no, I'm not getting beat three times. I'm not getting beat three times. Like there's no freaking way. And then I also knew that um, it was because we played the second night match that Sloan had beaten Venus. And I was like, if I get my shot against Sloan, like I got a good opportunity here because I won a lot of matches against Sloan and we've had close matches if, if either way, if I won or lost. And I was like, I'll have a good shot, but I got to get through Madison. And she's always been tough for me because she just can blitz you right off the court. And there's very few players that can do that to me. Um, and she played absolute nights out, lights out. I was stuck in like four hours of traffic coming into the to the um, site, and it was just probably like the worst preparations of like nerves, anxiety of like, am I even going to make this match on time? Thank God I was playing like second match, and it's just one of those things that just nothing went my way. And she absolutely spanked me for for a good hour fifteen minutes. <laughs> I remember that it was like uh, Coco's late for her warm up. I'm like. Lay for her warm up in the semis of the U.S. Open, like how the it, hell it was. That it was not anticipated. Like <laughs> we were stuck in so much traffic. My physio Julian, who was riding with me, because Pat was already there because he was doing commentary or or something. He was just doing Pat Cash things, and and I he's like, we were stuck in traffic for so long. Like we had to pull over at a McDonald's because we both had to go to the bathroom so bad. Like that's <laughs> it was just obscene, obscene amount of traffic. But you know, it's part of part of the game it's part of how things turn out and, and how things get together and you know Madison played an unbelievable match and then you know you got you got your grand slam with Sloan so I know I was praying for, for you to lose I was praying for you to lose just just you know sorry love you to death however <laughs> you you were a bad matchup at the time for us I was like please let me lose. I, I would not even leave the site until I saw and made sure that you were going home. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> now Wimbledon, because that for sure, that year I thought for sure you were gonna get it. Um, you look at like your performances against Mugu, you always play her well, you play Venus well. Um, tell me about that year. 
Yeah, I I was I was actually going into that tournament. I hadn't hit a ball um, leading into Wimbledon because I had injured my foot for the first time, and I got it shot up. So I didn't hit a ball for like three days before the event. Pulled out of Eastbourne. Um, I lost early at her talking botch, which was I was two time defending champion. So I had like a really terrible lead in to um, Wimbledon. I think I semi Birmingham or something or quartered. And I hurt my foot in that match. And I was like, cool, got it shot up. He's like, you can't do anything for the next couple of days. So I literally sat on the couch in Wimbledon Village and like Pat was like, let's make sure no one sees you. Like, we don't need anyone knowing that you're hurt. I'm like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I literally go in the day before hit indoors because I didn't want to hit on the grass. Right. Um, just to make sure my foot was like on stable footing. And, and so I didn't even have a hit for a week on grass until I played my first round at Wimbledon. And I just, you know, smoked through everybody. It was just one of those tournaments where it was just like, maybe I had a close first set, maybe a close second set, but the next set was just like six, one, six, two, like no one could touch my serve. I was like locked into everyone's return, my return games. And it was just, rolling and at some point in time I just looked at the draw and, and saw the opportunity in front of me of Muguruza who I I own in a way like I have a very good record never lost her on grass and Venus which I was like I want that revenge from from Australian Open like mm -hmm. I, I, I was up a set on her at Australia just wasn't focusing on finishing I was like man I could be in a finals playing Serena like how cool would that be and then I was like, okay, you know, what, if I just get to the to the semis, like, I'm good. I and I didn't even think about my quarterfinal opponent. And you know what? My <laughs> quarterfinal opponent just took me. Rabira Kova, Rabira Kova. That was like the most the she best only, of her life. Right. Only did well on grass. Like grass court player, like held and defended points at grass, like nobody's business. And she she just junked me to death. But I did have a good line at the umpire because we got moved to center court off of court one and I thought that her overrule on a challenge that I didn't have a play on the ball was baloney so like I got to say baloney to, in front of everybody on Wimbledon center court because I wasn't going to take the fine for cursing and saying it was bull I was like that's <laughs> such baloney like it, you got to be kidding me like it, this I had a play on the ball is baloney and right. like it was just repeat 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 <laughs> that was a good one yeah, I remember that match. She was, she was, she was tough. That year, Ro Ramiro Kova was tough. I mean, she was chopping. Yeah, I think she retired yeah. like the next tournament. Like that's as good as I'm gonna do. I made, I made semis of Wimbledon. Like that's it. That's all I no. got. So, talk about getting to say what you want to say. I remember we were in Zhuhai, <laughs> and it's the WTA Elite, which is like not WTA Finals, but those who don't make the finals, you know, just barely don't make the cut. You go to what's called WTA Elite. It was in Zhuhai. Uh, maybe not the most desirable place, but whatever. So player party happens. Or just the whole thing. You walk around with a shirt that says, I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> and then I didn't and I, 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 I kept, well, I did, but I didn't. <laughs> so it's a long story. I actually got a lot of people in trouble. And it's why actually we were able to get the Hologic deal because they'd seen that I had kind of talked out against China in a way. I was not a China fan. I didn't like going to China. I was, I've always been burnt out after us open. I mean, for Americans, it's like, this is a creme de la creme. Like we've hit us open, like what's after. And there's huge tournaments after you got Beijing, you got Wuhan, Zhuhai. And the only reason I kept playing was we were in the Fed cup final that year. And playing for my country has always been like my biggest honor and biggest goal in tennis, period. And so I, I kept, I told my agent, I was like, pull me out of Zuhai, don't want to play it. And she's like, you'll get fined. And I was like, for what? Not wanting to play a tournament that's a year, it's a fake year in championship for everyone who <laughs> didn't make it? Like, for what? And it's like, yeah, well, I mean, it's guaranteed money. And this, I was like, I don't care. Like, I don't want to go back to China. I'd just been in Moscow. I'd already gone to China for a month. Like I was over it. And she's like, I, no, like, let me tell you the number you're going to get fine. And I, once I heard that, I was like, I'll be on the first flight to Zuhai, however the heck I got to get there and let's go. <laughs> and 
I was so pissed. I was hanging out at the the fun place, which was the bar, right. uh, with all the Australians every night just to get some entertainment. Zuhai had just gotten hit by a hurricane, so I couldn't even like go. Our hotel was like in shambles. I like, was there. Things were fall. Yeah, <laughs> things were falling from the ceiling, and like it was wild. And uh, I hated my time there the whole time. And as things go. I made it to the final and almost won the damn thing. So <laughs> I was about to say, so you opened up the tournament with a t-shirt. Literally, you came downstairs with that shirt and we're like, is she serious? Is yeah. she gonna wear yeah. that? Like wearing it to the player party. And it was like it's, it's still in my closet. I just gotta get the the frame out. So the WTA sends you like an email and like a list of how much money you've just been fined, the reason behind it, the tournament, the date, you know, yada yada yada. I want to frame it, frame the shirt when I retire and just have it hanging here in the office somewhere. Because <laughs> the fine was so egregious. And I was like, I literally sat down to whoever was running. The, we have supervisors that run the tournament. And I said, if you find me this amount of money, like for my freedom of speech of putting it on my social media, wearing it on my body, like that's not cool where I come from in, in the US. We have freedom of speech. Like you could, if you find me, I will sue the hell out of you. Good luck. Like, that's how, like, stiffer and bitter I was about being in zoo high. I didn't want to be there. <laughs> so, luckily, Marshawn Lynch had just done the Super Bowl and had been, you know, I'm just here so I don't get fined. And I was like, I'm just drawing inspiration from that. Like, you know, <laughs> give me the Skittles sponsorship. I actually got some free stuff from Marshawn after that. <laughs> His oh, mom, like, like, saw it on Twitter or something. So, it was... It was all in good fun, but some people take it too seriously, which I've never been that type. I've always been pushing the boundaries until I get told no and so, still pushing it further. Oh, man. So how'd that connect to the Hologic deal? Um, well, so Hologic wanted to support um, the WTA in pulling out of China. And Mickey Lauer told the story about, you know, how I kind of spearheaded some sort of, uh, you know, uh, fighting spirit against China and and I act uh, Kyle actually put together the deal for the WTA because he knows Steve Macmillan really well and still hang out with him all the time so it's it's kind of just went yin and yang together mm. um so you've had some famous coaches and I swear you must I mean they're all great tennis minds <laughs> but they're all very similar personality. So your criteria must be personality first, coaching second. Let me see if you can actually coach. But first, <laughs> you, you fit like the profile. You fit like the personality profile. So we'll go Craig Carton, Pat Cash, and now Luke Jensen, which Luke makes sense because you are both the ambidextrous. You all can both serve with both hands. You know, you both like, like yeah, that kind that's of fit. If anyone YouTube's Luke serving with both hands, like it's the craziest thing that he can do it so well and so naturally on both both ends. But personality is a big thing for me because you travel the world with someone. This place is boring. Like <laughs> most people you don't like. I mean, at least when I was traveling, like I had very few people I like to spend time with. So I needed to make sure I liked spending time with my team, which was my coaches. I grew up in a team atmosphere family where it's like you know basketball you got your teammates and you know volleyball swimming you got your teammates and for me being alone was awful I hated being alone and having that feeling of like I have no support like my teammates don't have my back so that was always been a big thing for me to have that foundational support within my coaches number one of like even if I might crash the car, someone better be pointing at somebody else and say it was their fault. And that better be my coach, you know? <laughs> and loyalty is huge. And those, and all three of those guys have brought immense loyalty to me and, and, you know, a little tennis along the way and a lot of trash talking. And, you know, it's, it's always been, been fun and, and a great adventure with, with all three of those guys. So give me a good credit card story. I've got, I've got good <laughs> stories about all three. I had Pat Cash on there. A year ago, so, credit card and I one, often see each other at the bar. This one was wild. We were in Madrid, and I was in my room getting treatment for my physio, Julian. And Craig always, um, because he couldn't nap. I mean, the guy couldn't nap. And in Madrid, nothing opens till 10, 11 p.m. So, like, I'm getting treatment done. I was totally planning on, like, crushing a nap before dinner. And 
got the blinds open in my room and I see Craig like walking, walking down the street. So it's, and it's like a big bay window. And we see like this girl woman that, that looks like a woman of the night, like just happened to come out at the, at, out of a door, like near where he was walking down the street. So we're like banging on my window to get his attention. We're like, we see you. That's what you're doing on your walks. Like you're going to see it. He's like, he like looks around, he sees the girl. He's like, no, no, like just starts like bolting. It out. And it just became the running joke of like the whole Madrid tournament. Uh, that was, that was one of my favorite like pranks on, on Craig that, that we managed to like accidentally pull. It was great. Uh, and Pat Cash, crazy guy. I mean, so, so Pat, Pat's really into yoga and like other, other different like healing and, and, uh, different things, which I think is cool. I mean, you take what you want and throw away what you don't want. And what Pat does, which I find still to this day, I'd give him crap about it. He does yoga anywhere. Like we, I have videos like on my phone still of like on the sidewalks in New York and he's just like crushing out a stretch in yoga. And it's so <laughs> awkward and out of place that it never, never makes sense. And the, it's, it's like, it'll be like dead ass in the middle of the sidewalk. People are walking around him and, and he's just, you know, knocking out like a cat dog in the middle of the sidewalk. I'm like, Dude, this is nuts. Like, I can't, I, and, but it's, it's great because I can, I can give these guys some crap about it and they can take it and laugh and, you know, they still do it. And it's just, it goes along with the tour, the traveling so circus. Cash, he was in the gym working out and he comes in the, in the uh, cafeteria with a bag of pills. And I'm like, what is he doing? It's like a bag of vitamins. I was like, this dude is crazy. I was like, what is he like? It can't be. He can't be that sick and have that many conditions where he needs that many pills. <laughs> All in a Ziploc bag. I'm like, this dude is like taking drugs. The, like which one? Of- where? Which ones are which? Like they all look like the same color too. Yeah, that, that, that okay. bag of pills was was really. I asked him a couple times what it all was and. Because he likes the ex, like different kinds of doctors and medicine, it's just all sorts of random stuff. I don't know. I mean, he's ripped and shredded, so it, it is. Working. I mean, for his age, he's in there like pushing the players out the way, trying to get on the machine. <laughs> like, you, you know, you're not playing anymore, right? You know, you're like <laughs> my, my hitting partners used to hate uh, when Pat was there at tournaments because he didn't travel every week. But when he was there, when I would sit and have water he would make them hit with him. So he'd still have his rhythm and timing. And like, <laughs> he was, it was, it was comical, comical. Like Fed Cup when we were in Belarus, I mean, he was making anyone and everyone hit with him while like I would go grab water and like, we just, we'd sit there and just be like, oh, <laughs> take all the court time. You got it. It's yours. <laughs> and Luke Jensen, who is the biggest coaching bluff in <laughs> So we're world team tennis at the Greenbrier and the Chicago Smash are spanking you all, right? We're up by like, what, six games or something going into the women's yeah. doubles. Yeah, and you all like- smoked Jack 5-0, which in world team tennis, like you can't let that happen. A 5-0 uh, is like a death sentence. Oh, you know, it was our strategic. So it was like, all right, <laughs> Jack's a little bit overweight right now. I know he's going to be out at the bar. So let's make Jack play three matches in a row. So we play men's doubles, mixed doubles, and then let him play the young boy, b not in singles. Yeah. And I was like, it worked. Because you push him. I think they kind of whooped our butt in um, men's well, he doubles. Was gonna, he's one of the best doubles players there is. Ever. So, I mean, it's, it's going to happen. But, I mean, definitely wore him down by the time singles came. Like, he was cramping. And we had TV timeouts, so like longer than normal timeouts, and everything could have gone his way, but he just got smoked. And I mean, humid as heck in West Virginia, middle of the day. Like it was, it was tough. It was tough. So then we then we got we got the women's doubles, and it's like Bethany, I think Jeannie, and then uh, we subbed Jeannie out, which I was like, maybe I did the wrong thing, and I put Sloan in. Sloan came in and like played. So yeah, point. that I thought was weird because like Jeannie wasn't playing bad. I mean, it was just like you were playing, she, you know, she was us. getting so tight. She was getting <laughs> yeah. so tight. I mean, like literally. There's there's two moments in my whole career 
that I've ever been more nervous. And it's my first point at the Olympics and playing world team tennis. That's, <laughs> I, I've never been more nervous in my life. So, so I understand G- how Jeannie was feeling. Oh my God. So we're like whooping y'all down. And then Luke just starts bluffing, running around, slapping five to the crowd with his wooden racket. I was like, he is so annoying. If he don't just shut up and let us win this money, right? <laughs> running around, he's pumping you guys up. I'm like, he's a total you guys, If you won this finals, you got a hundred grand per person. Yeah. Like this was, this was a thing you got to do. Oh, I'm we, well aware. Well aware. We were dead. <laughs> yeah. So then Sloan comes in, actually makes a couple first serves. Like we were down three points, came in, make like three first serves in a row, match point. Said, all right. So she served to you guys down a match point to the forehand. And you yeah, missed the aced forehand. me. Aced like, me, right, unreturnable. Ace. Just- I mean, like big. And Sloan doesn't serve big. Like for her to get an ace at that point in the match, I was like, okay, that's some balls, right? Why, why I wasn't covering my forehand anyway and just being like, you can serve in my backhand as much as you want. If you get the <laughs> flatty out wide, like, that's, that's all good. So, but, she, uh, yeah. so, so match point, sudden death for the whole damn season, right? It was like, all right, sir, same serve, Sloan, same serve. This one didn't quite curl enough. I was like, her forehand return is trash. Coco's forehand return is trash. Serve there again. <laughs> like, Bethany, stay right there. I swear I said, Bethany, stay right there. She can only take it line. She can't go cross on this return. And you know what I saw? Because I, Nicole's like, Nicole Malakar, who's an accomplished doubles player, she's like, you want me to take it? And I was like, Nicole, get your ass up at the net and don't freaking move. Like, <laughs> do not. She's like, you want me to cross? I was like, do not move. Like, <laughs> do not move. And so I was like, I'm sitting there. I'm toweling down. I got Kim, you know, hyping me up. And I'm like, okay, you know, I mean, Kim Kleiss just hyped me up. I got to do something. And, and like, I didn't even like blank stare, like no clue. It was like end all be all sudden death, yada, yada, yada. And the best thing that happened was I saw Bethany leave the net and go cross. Way early. And I was like, I was like, thank you. Slapped the crap out of that forehand, made it like back edge of the line. I thought like I hit it and I didn't hear anything, but I also heard like, cheering and I didn't know which way the cheering was going so I didn't know like <laughs> if the hot guy called it out or like god knows a chair umpire comes out of nowhere where they didn't even make calls but he calls right. it out and I'm just like what, what's happened did we win <laughs> you guys out. challenge it and I, I hey I mean Good Hawkeye moment. doesn't lie Hawkeye doesn't lie that, it was, so it's 99.9 percent correct is, but but there was also a storm the night before <laughs> <laughs> that, that blew the whole stadium apart and they didn't recount. So, so it blew See, every my, my version of the story. It's just, it doesn't, that doesn't happen in my version of the story. I, it's of your version. It can, like... <laughs> well, let me just say this. If you have a tent that is held down by concrete boulders, right? As you do, you, you know, tents are held down by boulders. They don't move. And the tents move with the boulders. Those cameras probably moved as well. So they should. I mean, it was COVID. Them. COVID, anything could have happened in COVID. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So the luckiest forehand, I, I will like forever remember. I mean, it was everything. Serve there. She's going here. Bethany, stay right there. Literally, it was like, could not have called it better. And I still have nightmares because I definitely could have used 100 grand. I mean, I, 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 I spent it wisely. I got myself, you know, a car. I thought it was cool. You got the and Tesla? Got, I got it wrapped. I, you know, I, I, saw, just, I, <laughs> I saw you driving down the highway in a, in a matte black or matte silver Tesla. I was like, matte silver. Yeah. I was like, that's definitely Coco. She thinks she's the coolest chick. Yeah, every time you see that, just I should put World Team Tennis on like the side <laughs> or the license plate or something because, you know, that's, that's what got me that car. <laughs> yes. Well, it is always fun. Uh, the tour misses you. We are happy you're going to be back. We look forward to seeing you at the French. Yep. Uh, we won't tell the world that if they serve forehand, you're probably going live. <laughs> on the Especially ad on side. the ad side. <laughs> right, right. That's on the ad side. <laughs> uh, but always rooting for you. Always love you. If I am at the French, I'll meet you at the bar. We'll talk some smack. We'll share some stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this has <laughs> been the Tennis.com podcast with two to three time Grand Slam semifinalist uh, and Grand Slam mixed champion. No, doubles, just regular, doubles, just regular. Yes. Just regular doubles champion, uh, Coco Vandeweghe. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Mal. <laughs>